Hello, we will call the meeting of the Senate Mining and Forestry Policy Committee to order. Today is Tuesday, February 15th. Uh, this will be our first meeting this year of the Mining and Forestry Policy Committee, and I think we all know each other, but as has been custom in other committees, we do a quick uh, run around the room of, of members just to introduce ourselves and staff doing the same. So we'll start with those in the room. We'll start with Senator Goggin and just make our way around the table. I'm Senator Mike Goggin, Vice Chair of the Committee, uh, representing Senate District 21. Victor Florell, Legislative Assistant to the Chair. State Senator Justin Eichhorn, District 5, Grand Rapids, Chair of the Committee. Jesse McArdle, I'm the new Committee Administrator for the Committee. Ben Stanley, I'm Committee Counsel. Just getting in there. There I go. I, I am, am I'm Senator, Senator Kunish, District, District 41. 41. <clears throat> okay, there Senator there. Isaacson, if you're on there, or Senator Tomasoni. David Tomasoni, Senate District 6. Thank you, Senator Tomasoni. Senator... Isaacson, Jason, Senator Jason Isaacson, and uh, Senator District 42. Okay, I think we're good. Uh, Senator Kerry Root is also a part of this committee, and we'll have her introduce herself if she joins the call. Uh, so first up, we are going to have an overview from uh, the Department of Natural Resources on the mining permitting process. So we'll go ahead and hand it over to the DNR to state your name for the record and go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, Chairman Eichhorn, committee members. Uh, I am Joe Henderson. I'm the division director for uh, Lands and Minerals Division, Minnesota DNR. I kind of tied all three topics together, um, Chairman Eichhorn. Uh, so I'm glad to be here physically with you this year instead of um, on Zoom links or, or team links. Um, I'll be presenting an overview of the DNR's role in mine permitting but then also the current status of the operating and proposed mines in the state, and then I'll wrap up with a high-level update on some of the litigation surrounding mining. Uh, this will be a review for many of you. I gave some of this presentation last year. Bear with me. I'll try and keep the talk moving right along. The process of permitting in Minnesota involves compliance with strong environmental laws, the rigorous science-based technical review of applications by DNR experts, a transparent public process and opportunity for public input, and if permitted, the ongoing review of amendments and compliance with laws and permit conditions covering mine operations, maintenance, and eventual closure and full reclamation. So an overview of how I propose to walk through the DNR's role in mine permitting. In the interest of time, this talk will focus on ferrous or taconite operations and non-ferrous mining. Remember, the DNR also oversees non-metallic and industrial minerals mining including peat, dimension stone, aggregate, and sand. First, I'll discuss waste characterization. It's usually one of the first steps towards permitting. We'll talk a bit about how companies evaluate their tails and their waste rock before they even have a mine project. Tails are the material left over after they've crushed and removed the targeted mineral. Companies need to know what the potential environmental effects are of their waste rock before they submit any plans to mine. Second, we'll look at the environmental review. Uh, even though the focus today is permitting, I felt I would include a couple slides on environmental review. You can clearly spend a whole hearing on that topic in the future. Last, I'll look at the actual DNR permitting, including water appropriation, public water work, dam safety, and the permit to mine, which includes wetland mitigation and financial assurance. So back to the beginning, what is waste characterization? I have a sample of, of core that I'd like to, to bring out now. Um, you can see it, you can hand it around. I tried to bring samples so that I keep it more interesting for those of you that have seen this many times. So this core that you're seeing handed around is, is an important part of waste characterization. I wanna drive home the importance of the DNR researchers in creating data and reviewing data to support environmental review and permitting. S companies will usually take drill core, just like the piece being handed around 
from the actual area of their proposed mine to understand the effects of leaching through the material and the constituents may be, which may be carried off in the water. The data sets the stage for a science-based discussion of the tails and the waste rock that may actually happen decades from now if a mine is developed. So you can see they'd crush that up, take the target minerals out, and, and do tests on it. Oh, I gotta advance the slide, sorry. So uh, these pictures that you see in front of you um, are of our Hibbing Research Facility. So on the right side of the slide, you have the larger stockpile type tests where for decades they'll leave actual minerals from a targeted mine site out to weather. They'll collect the water, we'll sample the water, and we'll do those characterization tests about what is leaching out, what constituents are in the water. On the left side, you have the small humidity cells where they may use smaller core like this that may come from thousands of feet underground uh, for a company that may want a, a potential uh, mining site. All of this work focuses on the waste rock and the potential environmental effects over time. I would like to invite uh, each of you to come to Hibbing uh, this year to see the actual uh, research projects as well as the core library a little bit uh, when it's a little bit nicer outside in the future. The next step is probably environmental review. Uh, I thought I should call out some basics of environmental re review uh, for mining projects. Environmental review is often when the mine plan and the details of a proposed project become public for the first time. The Minnesota Environmental Policy Act, or MEPA, requires that an environmental impact statement be conducted for all new mining projects. A new mining project can be a new operation, or it can even be a new pit at an existing operation. DNR is often the responsible government unit, or RGU. The RGU is the lead regulatory agency for the environmental review. There can be a single lead, like the DNR, the PCA, or the county, or when a project involves some key federal programs, you can have a joint federal and state environmental review, such as with PolyMet, where we were uh, teamed up with the Army Corps of Engineers in, in a joint state federal. We also work with, all tribal gov or with tribal governments on all mining environmental review. Very simplified now, uh, there are two levels of environmental review, each with distinct criteria in MEPA. There's the Environmental Assessment Worksheet, or EAW. It's a six-page worksheet with 31 standardized questions. It contains informa information about the project description, environmental setting, potential environmental impacts, mitigation measures. By statute, it's designed to be a brief document to disclose information necessary to decide if an environmental impact statement is needed. In practice, it's not necessarily brief. For mining, a mandatory EAW is triggered for mineral deposit evaluation other than natural iron ore, sometimes this is called a bulk sample, for expansion of a stockpile, tailings basin, or mine by 320 or more acres, or for 25% or more expansion of a plant. There's also an environmental impact statement, or EIS, this is a detailed, extensive document that includes a project description, alternatives for site, technology, modified design, modified scale. It compares the environmental, economic, and social impacts, looks at mitigation of impacts. An EIS includes a scoping process called a scoping EAW, which is intended to focus the EIS on information essential to inform permitting decisions. For mining, a mandatory EIS is triggered uh, triggers include construction of a new tailings basin for a metallic mineral mine or construction of a new metallic mineral processing facility. There's also the possibility of a discretionary EAW or EIS. This occurs when the government unit with approved authority or a proposer deems potential for significant impacts. So some general statements. Um, environmental review is a very very broad and can cover many topics. It's important to understand what it does and what it does not do. So what environmental review does. It helps, a permit, a, it helps permit approval decision makers understand the environment and socioeconomic impacts of a proposed project. It takes a hard look at the project for potentially significant impacts using the best available data. It explores ways to avoid, minimize, or mitigate potential environmental impacts through alternate designs, technologies, or practices. 
It gives the public early access to decision makers with multiple opportunities for input. There's public notice and public, a public meeting during scoping. There's a public notice and a public meeting for the draft environmental impact statement. There's public notice of the final EIS and there's public notice of an adequacy decision. I should note that environmental review laws prohibit issuance of permits until the environmental review process is complete. So what environmental review does not do? It does not approve or deny a proposed project. It doesn't guarantee that permits can be issued for a project. It doesn't analyze every conceivable impact from a project. And it doesn't answer any and all questions about a project. If a project meets state environmental review requirements, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will meet permitting requirements. However, a project must meet state environmental review requirements in order to be permitted. So DNR mine, permi mine permitting involves permits through both the DNR Lands and Minerals Division as well as the DNR Ecological and Water Resources Division. Key DNR permits for a mining project typically include water appropriations, public waters permit, dam safety permit, and a permit to mine. Each of these permits has its own set of legal requirements for issuance or denial, and each has an opportunity for appeal. Again, key permits may include the water appropriation permit. This is the DNR program and permits to manage water resources, both surface and groundwater, to provide for reasonable use while ensuring long-term sustainability and natural resource protection. Work in public waters permit. If a proposed project will affect the course, current, or cross-section of a public water, it may require a public waters permit. Think of things like culverts and bridges. A dam safety permit. This is the program that issues and manages permits to regulate the construction, alteration, operation, maintenance, and closure of dams to protect public health, safety, and welfare. This program manages dams, all dams in the state. As you can imagine, much of the work comes from amendments to these permits. Amendments are needed for continued project modification, expansion, even the progressive reclamation and closure of projects. The purpose of the permit to mine is to control, all, to control the possible adverse environmental effects of mining by ensuring orderly construction and development of a mine, sound operation practices, and progressive reclamation of mined areas. The permit to mine also include provisions that govern wetland impacts and mitigation and is the key permit for setting financial assurance requirements for a mine. For Ferris projects, the rules were promulgated in 1981. For non-Ferris projects, they were promulgated in 1993. Some key elements of the permit to mine, again, wetland replacement plan. This assures no net loss of wetlands. Waste characterization, I already talked about that a bit. We discussed the importance of understanding the relative reactivity of the materials excavated before mining operations. And financial assurance. This is the mine permittees money set aside to ensure sufficient funds are available for the state to complete reclamation if the company fails to do so or to complete corrective actions. Just like I called out waste characterization with its individual slide and topic as a key element in permitting, I also want to call out financial assurance. Financial assurance ensures that there's a source of funds to be used by the commissioner if the permittee fails to perform. They can fail to perform reclamation activities, including closure or post-closure maintenance needed if operations cease, or they could fail to perform corrective actions if non-compliance with the design and operating plan occurred. The DNR must make an adequacy determination of financial assurance, which includes things like, is the amount sufficient to cover reclamation costs, including closure and post-closure maintenance, and any commissioner-ordered corrective action? Are the funds payable to the commissioner and available when needed? Is the assurance valid, binding, and enforceable under law? Are funds free from the impact of bankruptcy? Some key elements of ongoing maintenance for financial assurance, the permittee must annually estimate costs for financial assurance, and the commissioner may hire individuals with financial assurance expertise to advise the DNR. No specific type of financial instrument is mandated, but often there is a combination of tools, including cash, bonds, and irrevocable letters of credit and the permittee is only released when the site is fully reclaimed. 
Other agencies that participate in, in uh, remember that the DNR is, is always working with these other entities. Also, whoops, I, did I go back one? There we go, other agencies there. Uh, also, uh, the PCA clearly has a substantial role in, in permitting mining projects. Um, and, and that will end uh, the uh, high level permitting review that I had. Now, the next topic you asked me to cover, I'm sorry. I'll take just one quick, did you wanna, did you have a question on the permitting process, Senator Kunish? Or did you want to wait till the, is it more broad and can wait till the end? I, I had like specific questions on specific pages. Okay, well, so since we just went through the permitting part, we can take a quick break and just address any questions if you want to uh, the little part of the presentation you just went through. Mr. Chair, I, I can't hear anything she's saying. Sorry, sorry, I forgot Thank to. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Yep. Uh, I'm on the page DNR environmental review, and the first bullet point um, it says that the environmental, the EIS will be conducted for all new mining operations. And I guess my question is um, is there ever a review of, is there ever a review of, uh, of, Permits or or anything after the uh, the EIS has been done is there is there a permit review cycle that let's say you give a, a permit is done in 2020 so in 2005 and or like every five years every ten years is there ever a review of those permits to take into consideration changes in the environment, weather, um, un, unexpected changes? Mr. Henderson? Chairman, uh, Senators, there's an annual review every year with each facility of their operating plan, what they did in the last year, like areas that they had uh, progressive reclamation, where they intend to mine in the next year, how they intend to do that, and during those uh, discussions, we can bring up uh, topics in the permitting process um, if, in fact, uh, you know, we see issues like that, right? If, if uh, there's maybe there's gaining water in a certain area and we want to make sure that they, they uh, manage that water appropriately or if, if there's certain erosion in a certain area and we want to make sure that they go back and reseed or re-reclaim a certain area to make sure that we don't get uh, negative effects. Annually, we look at each of the facilities in permitting. So do Senator Kunish. Oh, thank you, front. Mr. Chair. So do, your, um, do the permits ever expire? Mr. Henderson? They have a date in them when issued. Um, the DNR has been working to try and set targets uh, for um, out of the polymet court, and it's coming up, I'll be talking about it, but out of the litigation, uh, the state Supreme Court said we had to set a numeric term. So we will be working to set a numeric term. Currently, um, in our permits right now, most of them are structured such that you will only be released when the DNR says you are complete with your reclamation and we feel uh, that you have met all requirements in law. The court has said we actually need to set a numeric date on that. Senator Kunish? And then, uh, our, and then the, the mining operation has the opportunity to reapply for it or it's done. Mr. Henderson? Chair, Senator Kunish. Um, that's detail we're still looking at is how we are going to actually um, put terms within permits. It would be anticipated right now that there would be a term for mining and then there would be a period like right now in rule where you're expected under a, like an eight year or a 10 year period to fully reclaim the site. Senator Kunish. Um, thank you, Chair. And then uh, let's see. 
I have to go back to my note here. Um, so on uh, DNR environmental review, oh, that's where you said it, um, uh, it prohibits the permit until the EIS is done. So that's not my question there, so sorry. Um, water appropriation, public waters and dam safety. Amendments needed for continued modification and expansion and closures, um, Chair. Uh, so who, who makes these amendments? Where do these amendments come from? Is that from the legislature or do the, um, the, dam, the dam people um, uh, ask you for those amendments? How does that work? Mr. Henderson. Chair, Senator Kunich, we actually have a group that is folk, uh, centered out of uh, environmental uh, ecological services uh, that have a dam, dam safety group. They have geotechnical engineers that work there, and they cover all the dams statewide. And so companies will apply. Again, we do annual inspections. There's annual reports. Companies will apply for a modification to their, to their dam safety permit. That's what it's called, right? And uh, our engineers will review those. Um, and uh, issue amendments if um, appropriate. Senator Kunish. Thank you. I, I have a few more questions. So That's just fine. Learning a lot of good stuff here. Um, on the DNR permit to mine page, the financial assurance, is there a general roundabout percent, um, like what is the percent required prior to the permit for, to ensure that there will be funds for reclamation or anything that, that needs to be done? Mr. Henderson. Chair, uh, Senator Kunish, no. It is site specific. It is based on the specifics of the waste characterization, the materials, uh, the potential uh, environmental effects of those materials, the size of the operation. You can see how, how size would, would uh, affect quite a bit uh, of, of what we may need. The type of mining that is being done, you know, the constituents within the waste rock, all of those things are considered um, and, and reviewed and, and annually. There's a, there's a review to see if financial assurance needs to go up or to go down, anticipating the next year. We're a year ahead always. Chair. Senator Kunish. So is, does, that, do, does the, the entity that is mining or the business, do they, I think it said that, you said that there's cash bonds, ir, irrevocable, all sorts of things for them to put up in, uh, in that uh, financial assurance, does that have to be 100% of what is estimated the cost might be, or is it a percent of it, or how does that work? Mr. Henderson. Chair, Senator Kunich. Actually, when we look at some of the, mo the mines, it's greater than 100%, mm. because there's contingencies built in for things that we may not have anticipated. So for example, if we use PolyMet, I believe there's a 20% in some areas and a 15% in other areas, contingency. So it's actually above 100% of what we believe it's, it's going to be needed. Great. Senator Kunish. One more You're question. You're just fine. The, the, today's goal is education, so yeah. ask away. Good deal. So on, um, when you talk about agencies and participants, um, I, I'm kind of curious about the tribal governments. Uh, historically, have they been a part of this conversation? If not, how have they been brought in? And then what does... What does um, participation by the tribal governments look like? Mr. Henderson. Chair, Senator Kunish. I have been working with the tribal governments. I worked for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency before I came to the DNR. We have had quarterly meetings for 14 years now. And now, since COVID hit, um, and we've had quite a bit of mining, we actually changed those from quarterly to every other month. So we meet with the tribal technical staff, they actually set the agenda to the meetings, and, and we review mining projects with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, usually it takes us three, four hours to get through the agenda. We'll bring in companies to talk in front of the, the tribal groups to present projects, and, and the tribes can ask questions uh, for as, usually as long as, as, as they want. So there's a lot of cooperation, right? But then there's also opportunities for formal consultation um, and, and those exist, you know, through our commissioner's office. Uh, there's a consultation, it's my understanding, yearly with each tribe. And 
mining is frequently talked about at those. Um, additional, just to our quarterly, we do send out early notices um, when we're going to do mining. We send out early notices to the tribes, just like we would send out to other local governments. Uh, to give them extra time to look at things. Um, they have technical staff that have been working on these projects for decades. And, and so um, we then, you know, we'll, we'll meet with them and, and uh, again, at the quarterly meetings and others to, to understand their uh, comments and concerns. Senator Kunish. One more question, and then I'm, the more you talk, the more questions I get. So um, looking at this group of folks that you participate in, what is the weight of the decision making? If there has to be a decision made, uh, is there a vote? If one entity says, no, we are not comfortable with this, we don't agree to this, we don't want this, um, how much weight does the tribal governments or US Fish and Wildlife Service put into that? How is it decided to override somebody that maybe objects to a, a project? Mr. Henderson. Chair, Senator Kunish. Typically, we work very, very hard to get along with our partners, um, and, and many instances, we will connect a project proposer right with a tribal government or someone else. There are many projects that uh, go above and beyond the law and the rule to uh, appease one of the government agencies or, or a tribal agency and put special conditions in permits um, to satisfy some special concerns that they justifiably may have. Uh, in the end, you know, as the regulatory agency over a permit, just like PCA would have ultimate authority over their permits, the DNR has a th ultimate authority in decision making and responsibility over our permits and defending our permits. Thank you. Senator Kunish. I'm done for now. Thank you. All right, you. perfect. Uh, we're still on the permitting uh, section. If anyone has additional questions for Mr. Henderson on the permitting, I'll look online quick. Not seeing any, go ahead and put your hands up if there are. I've got a couple on the permitting side. Uh, before we go on to the update on some of the lawsuits and status of mining projects. Um, there's been a lot of consternation around permitting, obviously, because you guys want to get it right, but obviously the industry and would like things to go quicker. So I'm just kind of curious, what's kind of the quickest turnaround times uh, that you've had on permits? And what it, what is kind of the average? What's the quickest and what's the average? Boy, I... I uh... You know, many of our permits, if you look, uh, there was some legislation years ago, I think there was a 160-day target. Most of our permits meet that target. But realize most of those permits aren't a permit to mine, and they're not mining permits. Mining permits are not easy. They're, they're, there is a ton of science and data and, and a lot of involvement. And, and you are correct, Chairman, uh, the rigor with which we look at these permits is, is of the highest level. Right. Yep. So, um, you know, there are, I, I believe, the, the polymet permits from from time um, that the complete application was sent in to to a decision was about 18 months. Um, but there are, you know, more examples of of work in public waters or water appropriation or other permits that, you know, typically meet the 160 day goal. How about I, the other part I didn't ask, what's like the longest What's the longest turnaround time you've had on issuing a mine permit? I think, I, I think I like polymet, it's like feels like 15 years. <laughs> um, I know not that entire time is permitting, but a lot of it was. I mean, if you could kind of speak to that and kind of what's the longest. Sure, polymet was, uh, Chairman, polymet was, um, much of the time was an environmental review. And their permits, they, there was a choice that their permits came in actually after the adequacy decision. You can actually start permitting before environmental review is finished and there's an adequacy decision, but you cannot issue a permit until an adequacy decision. Polymet's decision, sometimes it's a good one because things change during environmental review, right? And you want your permits to be spot on. So Polymet um, did not turn in their applications until after the adequacy decision was made. So their project probably took longer than many others. You have many other projects that will turn in permit applications while environmental review is ongoing. That's a little more efficient, but of course as a proposer you take the risk then because things do change in environmental review that as things change you're going to have to amend your permits then. That are, they're not issued of course, but they're in process. Right? You gain information, as you should, during environmental review, and sometimes it affects your permitting. So, I, Chairman, I'm sorry, I don't have a number for the longest. I'm, 
I, I'll be honest, I'm sure there's permits that have stalled out and never been issued because the company and the, and the state couldn't necessarily uh, find common ground. All right, how many permits are currently in the queue, if you're aware of that number? Yeah, Chairman, for, for mining, I know that um, I just heard, I think we have 27 uh, permit to mine applications that we worked on in 2021, and I think the response was we probably have about that many amendments or new permits still in the queue. Yeah. And for somebody that would want to get an expedited permit, how would they go about that process? And what, what's like, when they do get it, what, what's, what's the time frame if they do receive an expedited permit? And Chairman, unlike the PCA that does have an expedited permit process, the DNR does not. And so we work on all of our permits. We have about a dozen people in the whole group that work on the permits and, and uh, we set priorities and triage and we work at, on all of them at the same time. Okay. A couple more. When someone issues a permit, how long does it take for it to be finalized? When issued, the permits are, they're applicable. Okay. Then my other question is, what, what's kind of the general cost that you see a company go through? I, I know the companies definitely have skin in the game in this process. If you can quantify like what that is, I know it's probably different for each person asking for a permit, but just kind of what is the realm of what, what companies spend on this process? With I know you can't speak maybe to the PCA side, but on the DNR side. And, and that is a good question, Chairman. But I, I again, you, you knew the answer a little bit that a, a peat permit versus a small amendment to a mining permit versus you know a new permit out of the gate are vastly different amounts of time. And, and even certain amendments can take a great deal of time and, and resource. Um, I, I don't really have an average, and I think the average would, would be, there'd be quite a slope to the to the bell of what an average might look like for what a, an amendment or a permit would cost. Maybe the better way to ask that is what, what would, how was the pricing determined? You know, that there, there must be some kind of determination up front that your permit's gonna cost you a million dollars or it's gonna cost you 10 million. There, there's gotta be some kind of determination up front, whether it's a percentage or whatever it may be. What does that look like? So, Chairman, that's a good question, and, and there is an application fee. When you, when you put your application in, there's an application fee, and then the DNR has ability to charge supplemental fees, right? So if we are spending a lot of our research and or our, our, our technical expertise time, we have the ability to charge extra fees so that it's not actually the, the taxpayers burdening you know, the cost of, of uh, moving through a permitting process for a company. So we, we bill the companies and they reimburse us for that. So even beyond the initial application fee, um, depending on the length, um, the companies are, are still paying for those processes. Looks like Senator Isaacson has a question. I'll let him jump in quick. You're still on mute, Senator Isaacson. Oh, there you Thank go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep, there we go. Say, so, uh, and I, and there's been a lot of questions, so if I'm being redundant, please let me know. Uh, how many people, like how many employees do you have that their job is just working on permits at the DNR? Mr. Henderson. Chairman, uh, Senator Isaacson, we probably have about 12 people in our research and our reclamation group with a few planners and those two groups are inseparable because you know we already talked about waste characterization and a few other things our research team the same people that are working to do the work in Hibbing and have been doing that kind of work for decades um, those same folks are um, actually working on permits and working on environmental review also so about Please. a dozen Senator Isaacson okay. all right thank you Mr. Chair and is a ballpark are fines a pretty common thing against mines? Is there like an average over five years of what we find mines if they've made mistakes? Mr. Henderson? That would probably be, uh, I'm sorry, Chair, uh, Senator Isaacson, that would probably be a better question for the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Typically, okay. you know, we work with their inspectors and, and uh, their enforcement programs. Senator so, Isaacson? Thank you. So like whenever you have noncompliance or, you know, permit violations, that actually isn't managed by you, that's managed by the pollution control. Mr. Henderson? <laughs> Chair, Senator Isaacson, there are instances where we do um, levy what might be considered a fine, um, sometimes fairly frequently. If someone were to have an uncontrolled uh, release into a wetland, 
So it's not mm -hmm. pre-approved, right? You didn't you didn't take a wetland um, with pre-approval and and mitigate it ahead of time. Usually, mm -hmm. we uh, require mitigation at potentially two times or, or more. Um, that is often seen as punitive because you didn't get the process approved ahead of time and there wasn't mitigation ahead of time. So those, I would say, are, are uh, not frequent, but they're not uncommon either. Otherwise, right, most of, most of the actions that are taken that you're hearing about are probably through the PCA. Senator Isaacson? We're unable to hear you, Senator Isaacson. Still unable to hear you. I think he's froze. No, I, I see him moving on mine. He's not froze. <coughs> Muted. Now go ahead and try again, Senator Isaacson. We were unable to hear your last question there. What happened there? Not sure. We can hear you again now, though. Go ahead. If you're talking to me, I can't hear you. Um, we are able to hear you now. We're able to hear you now, Senator Isaacson. Could I ask a quick question while we're waiting? Yes, go ahead, Senator okay. Konish. Um, I have a question here. So if, if changes are made to a permit, does that allow uh, for the public to go back and get a chance to review and comment on, on that permit for, about any of the changes that are, going to, that are being uh, proposed? Mr. Henderson? Chair, Senator Kunish. It depends on the permit and it depends on the change. So okay. for example, if a company were to come in and say, we're gonna do a name change, uh, something more of a, an assignment from one company to another, those are typically not public noticed. Um, they are not changes that we seek public input on. There are also what uh, permit modifications for the permit to mine, to use as an example, are broken into two categories or three. There's, a, there's the administrative or assignments like that, or there's non-substantial and substantial uh, amendments. And substantial amendments are public notice for 52 days and, and uh, public comment is, is taken and considered or objections are taken and considered. Um, and then non-substantial um, are not public noticed. And so those may be... Uh, much smaller in scale and or concern. And so, you know, that's just one example for the permit to mine of, of examples of, of where, yes, some are public noticed and there's a public process for, for objections. Are we stuck or I can't hear anybody at all? Senator Isaacson, if you're able to hear me, um, we went to Senator Kunish to ask a question, but we'll come right back to you as soon as her question is completed. And just one last question. Is there a website that shows all these transactions or shows all these permits where, where folks can become better informed and I guess for more transparency? Mr. Henderson. Chair, Senator Kunish, for our large permitting projects, we have actually launched websites for them um, where we actually have used the websites to take public input and comment and to give updates. We send quarterly messages out for smaller uh, permit proposals or, or project proposals, there is not. Senator Kunish. So would that be through your MPCA page or where would we find that? Mr. Henderson. Sorry. Um, DNR. DNR. I work for oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Senator Kunish, we, we, at, one, at some point we will have the pollution control in as well, so we'll be able okay. to ask some of those questions of them That was as well. right on my, on my page here, so that's why I said it. Sorry. Apologies. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Uh, Senator Isaacson is back on. If you can hear us, Senator Isaacson, go ahead. Uh, maybe he's still having technical difficulties. I did have one other question before we move on, and that's in relation to um, the permit. You talked about how the pollution control had some expedited permitting opportunities.
Do we get it fixed? Hopefully. I think so. All right. I apologize. No, no problem. Just having a few technical difficulties for anyone listening. Hopefully we're good to go there. I'll finish. So you uh, spoke of kind of how the pollution control has expedited permitting. And I'm just wondering how come you guys don't have that same authority? Is it because it doesn't exist in statute or you choose not to do it? Um, and maybe that's an area we're missing. I, I think if, if not, that might be something that we would probably want to look at making sure you guys also had that expedited authority. So if you could speak to kind of that process and why you guys don't have it, I think that would be helpful also. Yeah, Chair, um, unless something has changed in the last decade, back when I worked for the Minnesota Pollution Control Ag Agency, their expedited program was basically an agreement between staff and companies that they would put in additional hours above and beyond the 40 hours that they worked in a traditional pay period, and that companies would pay them in those additional hours to work on projects to allow them to maybe move up in the queue, so to speak, right? Um, so I would imagine um, I, it's something I can look into. I don't know if there's a, a union or statutory or other law preventing the DNR from doing that, but you always have to have people willing to do that and, and to work those extra hours to be able to, to move things around in an expedited process, unless something's changed at the PCA. So okay. we could look into that. So Mr. Henderson, there's no way for someone to move up in the queue, so to speak. It's just if staff is willing to do extra hours. Did I understand correctly? Chairman, in, it, unless something has changed in the last decade, that was the way that the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency ran their expedited permitting program. OK. Uh, Senator Kunish might have Senator Isaacson's question. We'll open it up for him one more time. Did you have Senator Isaacson's no, question? Now, um, so nobody can hear anything at this point. Yes. OK, because they said that there's issues with as the mic, whoever was serving as a microphone for the entire committee appears to now be on mute, so we're not able to do anything at this point. Okay, yeah, that should be the most good video. I think it's particularly I didn't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like we're back up and running on the on the mic. So Senator Isaacson, if you're on there, if you want to finish your line of questioning, you're welcome to do so. I do not see any of the participants. I believe he needs to um, walk back on and we can let him in and he can, but I don't okay. see him. OK, it sounds like he's not there. So we, we may come back to one more permit. Per, we, we'll move on for now. But if Senator Isaacson comes back on, we might jump back to permitting just so he can finish his questioning there. So if you want to continue on to the next section, um, I think we're ready to go. To you, Mr. Henderson. Very good. Thank you, Chair, committee members. So now some information on both Ferris and non-Ferris operations in Minnesota. You asked for an update, right? The Iron Range has a history of, of iron ore, Ferris mining, dating back to the 1880s. Minnesota is the number one producer of iron ore in the USA. 80% of all the domestic supply of iron ore comes from Minnesota as well as we export to Canada. The Masabi Iron Range is the oldest continuously producing mining district in North America, almost 140 years of production. Six operations, taconite operations, running at full capacity equals 42 million tons of product each year. And I have another prop. I actually have a piece of, of taconite with a magnet uh, that you can hand around and, and uh, you can see actually what they're mining at Hibtac. Um, so many of you have seen this map before. Um, you know, I want to focus on the, the Iron Range and update on the projects uh, that you asked for. So you see the map in front of you. This is what most people think of when you talk mining in Minnesota. This is the Masabi Range. It stretches from Grand Rapids to Babbitt. 
Although there's some disagreement among scientists, the prevailing theory is that the Mesabi Range was created after iron and silica corroded into an ancient sea. The presence of marine algae raised the oxygen levels enough to precipitate out the iron and deposit it in what is now the Mesabi Range. This all occurred about a billion years ago when there wasn't a lot of plant life to create oxygen. I will move from west to east or left to right with my updates. So furthest left, you will see ERPI plants four and two near Bovi. These plants were built and operated by magnetation. These are scram mining operations, meaning that they are remining abandoned waste rock stockpiles and tailings basins and recovering the iron to create iron concentrate for the market. Magnetation's plants got started in 2009 and employed about 400 people at one time. Magnetation filed for bankruptcy in 2015 and eventually was purchased by ERPI. ERPI, uh, out of bankruptcy in 2017, purchased by ERPI out of bankruptcy in 2017 only to have ERPI file for bankruptcy in 2018. The Chapter 7 bankruptcy trustee has been selling off assets of the company. Recently, Mag Iron LLC, a company owned by Oddly Capital Partners, an investing firm from London, and Larry Lettinen have made an offer to purchase some of the assets associated with ERPA, ERPI. That sale was approved by the bankruptcy court just a couple weeks ago. Next, you'll see the location of the Masabi Metallics Project, currently under construction near Nashwalk. This facility is one which the DNR is monitoring closely. Under a master lease agreement, the facility was required to meet very specific requirements by May 1st, 2021. The DNR concluded that the requirements were not met and took action to terminate the state mineral leases issued to Masabi. Without these state mineral leases, the facility could have insufficient ore to operate as planned. In response to the termination, Masabi sued the DNR, alleging that they had complied with the master lease amendment and therefore termination of the leases was not legal. The DNR, working with the Attorney General staff, defended its decision. On January 28th of this year, the court concluded that the 2020 amendment did not become effective, meaning that Masabi had not done what they needed to do, and therefore, Masabi was in default under its leases. The court also awarded the DNR a monetary judgment in unpaid royalties of roughly $17.5 million. Now, following any appeals, the state will consider options to offer these leases to credible mining companies. Further east is ERPI plant number one. This was the first magnetation scram mining facility, and it was included in the same bankruptcy case as the other two ERPI facilities. However, portions of this facility were purchased in 2020 by Prairie River Minerals, and they used this site and one nearby to create a demonstration facility for scram mining. Their operation became fully permitted in fall of 2020 and processed historic stockpiles and marketed lump ore in center fines in the spring and summer of 2021. On January 13th of this year, Prairie River filed an assignment for the benefit of creditors in state court. This process is a voluntary alternative to bankruptcy proceedings. The DNR will continue to monitor these proceedings. Just to the north is U.S. Steel's Kiwatin Taconite facility. Keytac produces a 66% iron traditional taconite pellet. Keytac employs about 399 people. It's been in operation since 1969. Moving up the range is Hibbing Taconite, where I passed the, the piece of ore around came from Hibtac. This mine is operated by Cleveland Cliffs and is a joint venture between Cliffs owning 85% and U.S. Steel at 15%. Hibtac has been in operation since 1976 and employs 735 people. This facility is one of the two Minnesota facilities involved in the sale of portions of ArcelorMittal's U.S. operations to Cliffs Natural Resources in the fall of 2020. Hibbing Taconite has about five years of iron ore supply left under their current lease reserves, and they are seeking to negotiate access to additional ore with private and public mineral owners. Next is Mining Resources, just south, south of Chisholm. This is an idled scram facility owned by Steel Dynamics out of Indiana. This site supplied concentrate to the Masabi Nugget plant during its operation. When the Nugget plant was idled in 2015, the scram operation was idled as well. They're currently looking at closure and reclamation of this site. Just north of the city of Mountain Iron is U.S. Steel's Mintac Taconite Mine. 
This is the largest iron mine in the United States and the single largest miner of school trust ore. It began operation in around 1967 and employs about 1,389 people. This mine, along with Keytac, produces almost half of the iron pellets on the range and the other half of the production coming from the Four Cliffs facilities. As the iron formation starts to turn back south, we enter the area known as the Virginia Horn. We first see Cliff's Menorca Taconite Mine. The Menorca operation stretches across the Horn towards Gilbert and Bowabic. It employs about 354 people and first began operation in 1977. At the base of the Horn near Eveleth is the United, Tac Mi United Taconite Mine. This is another of the Cliff's natural resources mines. This is the mining operation which had the state move Highway 53 a few years back. They are now mining in that area. UTAC began in 1965 and employs 514 people. You can see that UTAC ships its crushed ore by rail slightly to the south for processing into pellets. We jump now to the area of Aurora and Hoyt Lakes, and we find the former LTV mine site, which is owned by Cliffs Erie. Within this site, you have the idled Masabi Nugget plant. During its operation, it produced a nugget that was 97% iron concentrate. It could be used by arc furnaces. This was a value-added product. Nugget, as it's called, is owned by Steel Dynamics. It opened in 2010 and idled in 2015. The facility employed 132 people. The LTV property is also the home of Polymet um, and its tailings basin. We'll talk more about Polymet when I talk about non-ferrous sites. And on the far east of the Masabi Range is the North Shore Mine near Babbitt. North Shore mines and crushes on site and then ships its crushed ore 47 miles to Silver Bay at their pellet plant. North Shore is the site of the first taconite mine in North America. Mining began there in 1955, and they employ 562 people. My slides aren't advancing. I think I just lost. It kicked me out. There we go. Thank you. Now moving on uh, to non-iron metallic mineral projects. Minnesota has one of the largest undeveloped reserves of copper, nickel, and precious metals in the world. I'll quickly give you a look at the location of some of those projects. I'm not going to touch on each one of these, but just focus on a few. Moving from southwest to northeast, again, kind of left to right, Encampment Minerals has a number of exploration deposits, which include titanium oxide and copper nickel deposits in the area of Hoyt Lakes. These include Wyman Creek, Section 22, Long Nose, Long Ear, Skipbow, and Serpentine. You've heard a lot about Polymet and the North Met copper nickel deposit over the last few years. The DNR issued permits to Polymet in November of 2018. Litigation followed and is still ongoing. Appeals to the permit to mine and two dam safety permits for the facility went all the way to the Minnesota Supreme Court. Based on the Supreme Court ruling, September 24th, the DNR announced a plan to hold a contested case hearing to examine whether the use of bentonite clay in the proposed tailings basin will be practical practical and workable reclamation technique, which will reduce infiltration of oxygen and water to the stored basin. Uh, timeline for the hearing has not been set by the administrative judge. Based on the Minnesota Supreme Court ruling, the DNR will also need to establish a term for the permit to mine and decide whether to add Glencore to the permit. These issues are not part of the contested case hearing. Just north of Polymet, near North Shore Mine, is Tech America's Masabi deposit. Tech is conducting both exploration and waste characterization at this time. Finally, in the Duluth complex, you move north to the Twin Metal deposit, most notably the Maturi deposit near Highway 1 and just east of Birch Lake. This copper nickel deposit ranges in depth from about 1,000 feet to about 5,000 feet below the surface. Proposers have developed a plan for an underground mine and dry stack tailing storage facility. This proposal is currently in early stages of environmental review at both a state and federal level. On January 26th of this year, the Department of Interior canceled two hard rock mineral leases within the project proposal for mining. The DNR is considering what this development means to the state. Okay. 
Moving uh, way south of the previous map to Aiken and Carleton counties, on the left-hand map, we have a very unique copper nickel deposit near the small town of Tamarack. This is my last prop. <laughs> Thank you. You'll be able to see the copper and nickel in this uh, core sample with your, with your bare eye. Um, it appears to be a highly mineralized deposit that's being explored by Talon Metals Corporation. Talon continues to drill to better define the deposit, and they've been expanding the size of what was originally thought to be a very small deposit. Talon has recently started conversations with the DNR on materials characterization. You may have heard that this January, Talon Metals, through a subsidiary, Talon Nickel, signed an agreement to supply nickel concentrate to Tesla for batteries to be used in electric vehicles and clean energy projects. According to the agreement, Tesla agreed to purchase 75,000 metric tons of nickel concentrate from the Tamarack Nickel Project. To the west of Tamarack, on the right-hand map, is the Emily Manganese Iron Deposit. North Star Manganese has private mineral leases in this area and has requested state mineral leases. The manganese found in Crow Wing County is the second largest known manganese deposit in the United States. Manganese is an essential alloy used to convert iron into steel making steel less brittle and adding strength. More recently, manganese has become an increasingly important mineral for the manufacturing of green energy technologies, such as electric vehicle batteries and off-the-grid power systems. So quickly, a summary of some non-ferrous mining points. There are no active non-ferrous mining operations in Minnesota. Non-ferrous mining involves mining of copper, nickel, and precious metals like platinum and palladium. They're found in the Duluth complex and near the Tamarack area. One facility, Polymet, was permitted in Minnesota and now that is under court challenges. Open pit mines can be much deeper than taconite mines on the Mesabi range, the typical taconite mines. Underground mining, such as that proposed by Twin Metals and discussed by Talon, would be 1,000 to 3,000 feet below ground in underground mines. Chair, would you like me to pause here again or continue on to the last update? I've kind of blended them with litigation. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and continue, Mr. Henderson. We can uh, blend them together with questions as well. They do kind of blend together. Sure. Now the last update that uh, you requested. Um, I've given legal updates on Polymet, Masabi Metallics, and ERPI in my walkthrough of the Ferris and non-Ferris facilities in Minnesota. I'd like to talk about one other area of litigation, the non-Ferris mine siting rule challenge. Sorry about this slide. If your eyes aren't glazed over, uh, this slide will do it for you. On June 24, 2020, Northeastern Minnesotans for Wilderness sued the DNR under the Minnesota Environmental Rights Act. Northeastern Minnesotans for Wilderness claimed in its lawsuit that Minnesota's non-ferrous mine siting rule was inadequate to protect the boundary waters. Currently, Minnesota rules do prohibit mining in the BWCA and prohibit mining that disturbs the surface in a specified area around the BWCA. This area is called the Mineral Management Zone. At the DNR's request, the court issued a September 13, 2021 order sending the case back to the DNR for further proceedings. This approach will allow the DNR, as the state's primary regulatory authority for mining, to assess the adequacy of the siting rule through a robust administrative process that ensures that agency experts have an opportunity to carefully consider all relevant evidence. The DNR opened a 30-day public comment period on the question included in your slide here. I will not read it to you. Um, the DNR received roughly 5,500 submissions during the public input period. Um, we're working on a process to review and consider each comment received. By September 12th of this year, the DNR is planning to make a decision on whether the siting rule is adequate to protect the boundary waters or if further restrictions on mining should be extended into all or part of the Rainy River headwaters. So in summary for today, Minnesota has world-class mineral resources and world-class natural features. Environmental review and permitting are complex tasks to protect all interests and involve multiple federal, tribal, state, and local government entities. There are transparent processes for input into agency decisions and appeals for final decisions. Mining projects are complex and are at various stages of development, expansion, and closure. 
DNR and state leaders continue to improve coordination and processes to meet new challenges and opportunities. The DNR's regulatory work is separate from our fiduciary role in management of state minerals. The DNR is filled with top-notch scientists and regulatory staff that provide thorough and independent review of project proposals and ensure compliance with, at all mine sites. We base all of our regulatory decisions on strong science and the application of state environmental protection laws. I know this was a long presentation today, and I want to assure you that Honestly, I just scratched the surface of the depth of the regulatory work that exists at the DNR. Um, I'll stand for additional questions now. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Members, questions on the second part of the presentation? S Senator Kunish. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, on the litigation page, uh, you mentioned about the um, prohibits mining that disturbs the surface in a specific area around the BWCA, the mining uh, mineral management zone. What is that zone? I mean, how much are we talking about? Mr. Henderson. Chair, Senator Kunich, that zone varies. Um, originally, it's my understanding it was set up to include sub watersheds that might flow into the boundary waters to ensure that there was no surface disturbance there. And, and so you can foresee an opportunity where an underground mine might be able to be in those areas, but no surface disturbance so that it would protect that watershed that would flow into then the boundary waters. So the answer, I'm sorry, is it varies. Sometimes it's much larger than others depending on, at the time, what was viewed as the scale of the sub-watershed. Thank Senator you. Senator Kunish. Along. There are maps. I can get you a map if you would like. Yeah, I'd be really curious. Thank you. And one more yep. question, please. Um, so you said the DNR received roughly 5,500 submissions during the public input period, uh, 5,000 via the online. So what was the outcome of that? I mean, is there, was there um, you know, a heavy uh, weight one way or the other? What was the outcome or where could we see those, those comments or, or suggestions? Mr. Henderson. Chairman Senator Kunish, we're working right now to get them in a singular format. Most of them luckily came in via our web portal. Again, here's a website where we put up a specific portal with information and, and to educate and, and, and gov deliveries on steps and everything. Um, we're looking to, many of them came in via the portal. Those are easy to put in spreadsheets and easy to give to people if they were to submit a Data Practices Act, but then some came in in the mail. Some came on disks. Some came on pen drives. Some came on postcards. And you get, and we've got to scan every single one of those. And so I can't even tell you right now uh, what kind of scale we have uh, for for comments. Of us. one comment supposedly was seventeen thousand pages. Mm. Just Senator one Kornish. follow up. Yep. So if. A person wanted to see the results of this of this uh, the submissions. They would have to request do it through a um, a data request, or will you be putting that on your website so that it's open to the public? Mr. Henderson, Chair Senator Kunz, we have traditionally not put people's information, their comments and information up on our website, but it is public information, and we tell people when they comment it's public, um, and so it is available upon request. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Senator Goggin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a question on the uh, page where you, you talk about a 140-year-old year uh, mining in, in the northern Minnesota there and six operations running at full capacity of 42 million tons <clears throat> per year. Do we have any idea how long our supply of iron ore is going to last until we've mined it all out of the ground? Mr. Henderson. Chair, Senator. That's a good question, and it, it becomes an economical one. The deposit dips, I am told, I am not a mining engineer, at about a 6% grade. And so at what point is it not, uh, or do you either have to go underground mining or uh, the cost of removing the overburden is too great? Um, we, I don't know that people know how deep it goes. Um, we have mines, though, that have clearly delineated um, 30, 40 years easy of deposits existing within their leases at full operation. Thank you. No more Senator. questions. Are there any additional questions? Mm -hmm. 
I'm not seeing any addi additional questions. So do you have any closing comments or I think, think you pretty got pretty much got it all. I uh, thank you for your time today, committee members. It was good to be here in person with you. All right. We appreciate the update for committee members. Um, again, I, I did kind of mention we will probably do something with Pollution Control Agency at some point, the same kind of education format, opportunity to ask questions and get an understanding where things are at. Uh, we don't get a lot of bills at this committee. Um, some of the ones we did get are uh, quite controversial, so we won't be diving into those, but we do have maybe one or two that are not overly controversial. Um, so we may hear one or two bills in this committee coming up as well. So just stay tuned to your email and um, we'll again maybe have another hearing or two in the near future. So watch for that. With that, uh, today's Senate Mining and Forestry Policy Committee is adjourned.